Stop what you're doing just for a second. Take a breath with me. There's so much to do in private practice and so many resources and trainings and things like that to focus on that we've brought it all together for you for a totally free event starting March 11th and going until March 14th. Level Up Week 2024 is coming up, and I want you to save that date. We have some amazing panels we're planning where we're bringing together people that have started a private practice, people that have started a group practice, and people that are rocking out mega group practices. Also, we're going to have some amazing keynotes and some trainings that are on very practical things. There's no need for you to bounce between Facebook groups wondering, you know, is this advice good? Uh, what should I do next? I don't even know of the 50 things that I need to be working on what I should do first. Instead, come to Level Up Week. It's totally free. You can be on the early bird list over at practiceofthepractice.com forward slash level up to get all the early notifications for when we open up registration. So again, that's practiceofthepractice.com forward slash level up. This is the Practice of the Practice podcast with Joe Santa, session number 965. I'm Joe Sanok, your host, and welcome to the Practice of the Practice podcast. I hope you are doing amazing. All this week has been Level Up Week. We have had over 15 webinars training you on how to level up. We do this twice a year. We have panels around solo practice, group practice, how to market yourself. Uh, we did all sorts of trainings on how to make sure this coming summer you don't have that summer slump. How do you focus on getting to that next level? And how do you know when enough is enough? Like what boundaries should you set as someone who owns the business and allows yourself to just chill out a little bit? So we covered a lot of that. If you did not attend those live, you can still get the recordings next week over at practiceofthepractice.com forward slash level level up. Also, all of our membership communities are going to get access to those uh, inside of Circle. So memberships are actually open right now today. Uh, they open twice a year for next level practice. That's our membership for solo practitioners. Group practice launch. That's if you are someone who is going from a solo practice to a group practice, that's open today. And then group practice boss. That's our program that's specifically for people that are already group practice owners. So we bring in all sorts of experts to help you. We have live events every single week. Uh, and we have over 30 e-courses that you get access to, plus discounts on any back-end support. So make sure you sign up. These memberships are only open through next week. Uh, you're going to want to make sure that you look at that and that you decide. I'm doing some Q&As also next week. So um, make sure that you sign up for those over at practicethepractice.com forward slash level up. So a very busy week for us and all sorts of things that we are covering. Well, I'm so excited. Today we have Rachel Woodward. And Rachel is a healthcare advocate and the CEO of Data Pro Billing Service, an expert in insurance reimbursement. Rachel helps healthcare providers and facilities to optimize and project their finances and manage insurance billing so they'll be able to focus on high quality care while maintaining confidence in their bottom line. Rachel, welcome to the Practice of the Practice podcast. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, let me just start with how'd you get into this work of, of doing insurance billing? So it's funny because this was not um, this was not my intentional path. It uh, so my mom actually started this company when she had me thirty three years ago, and it was originally just supposed to be a little side gig for her to stay home, raise her kid, and um, have a little bit of extra spending money. And that's pretty much what it was my entire life. Um, but I got to hear around the dinner table top just hear, hear her conversations of like, oh, you know, I was able to help get this person covered for this. And I just heard little things about it here and there. So I feel like my, my education on it is actually really personal. Um, but when I started to get involved was um, probably a little over 10 years ago, and insurance started covering mental health and substance abuse facility services. And there was a huge boom in that in California. Um, and my mom just happened to be kind of in the center of it and got pulled into it and her company blew up. It, it just went from this small private practice, um, billing company to where she was billing out millions and millions of dollars and hiring people and just trying to get the work done. 
Um, and as that started to fall off, I was, um, I was in a, I was in a marketing position, a sports marketing position. And it was just this interesting time where I was kind of, I was feeling a little bit done and she needed some help. So I said, Hey mom, let me come in. I'm super operational. Let me come in. I can help organize your staff, get some policies and procedures in place and, and do a little bit of marketing for you. So I thought that I would come in as like a consultant and just enhance her business. And as soon as I got into it, I was like, well, this is actually really cool. We're helping real people. We're helping doctors. Um, there's a lot of numbers involved, which it's so surprising to me that I actually like the numbers and diving into the reports and, and again, just like optimizing um, the finances of providers and facilities who are doing like really amazing work. So that's how, that's how I got into it. Um, like I said, I thought it was going to be a really short, maybe six month to a year stint. And here I am a um, little over 10 years later and just really enjoying the work that I'm doing and, um, and, the, and, the, and the work that I get to do with providers that ultimately impacts patients and those who really need medical care. Oh, so awesome. Well, when you when you think about um, the things that people do wrong with their billing, let's start there. Uh, we have lots of people that are solo practitioners and people with mega groups, so 50 plus clinicians listening to the show. Uh, what are things that the clinicians or business owners do wrong when it comes to billing? So I think one of the easiest, but also the m- most commonly overlooked is just the intake process, making sure that from the get-go, you have all of the information that you need in order to bill insurance. So making sure that you have a driver's license with a name that matches the insurance ID card, making sure that you have a copy of an ID card in case there's a typo when you go to bill the insurance company. These are like the smallest things that really make a huge difference. And then to add on to that, um, having the just the transparent conversation with your client ahead of time and also making payment options accessible for them so they don't have to go looking for ways to pay you. Um, I love like electronic, like there's so many EHR softwares out there today that incorporate all of these things. You can do the intake, you can store all of the medical records, you can submit the claims, you can schedule and your patients can pay. So I think that operationally, there's so many things that get overlooked that will really make a huge difference um, in your bottom in a provider's bottom line. Mm. Now, I know one thing we were talking about before we got started uh, was when to outsource billing and when to hire a consultant to help keep it in-house. And I know that you do both of these things. Maybe can you talk about the pros and cons of each? Sure. So um, I'll start with in-house billing. That's obviously the bulk of our business. And that's where, you know, we really started. And um, and I think what's really nice about outsourcing your billing, if you're, if you're working with a company who is responsive, um, is they're doing this every day. Like that is their primary job. They know how to fight with insurance companies, hopefully. They have proven and effective appeal letters that they're sending out every single day that work. There's follow-up processes that you follow so that the claims are getting followed up on um, within a week of the time that you receive the denial. And I found with a lot of um, groups or practitioners that do the billing in-house, there's usually a dedicated person, if it's not the provider, but they're typically as a business, uh, like a business manager, administrative assistant, who's responsible for booking the appointments and then submitting the claims and following up. But I think what happens there and what what ends up holding up um, claims is that this person gets busy. And so they might get a denial on Monday and say, okay, I'm going to follow up on it. But with like the hustle and bustle of the day, that eventually gets lost or maybe pushed back. And so there's all of this revenue that is left on the table or is not getting addressed until weeks after um, until weeks after the original denial. So the overall claim turnaround time and speed of payment is delayed. 
So that's one thing that I really notice with outsourcing billing versus doing it in-house. Some of the pros of doing it in-house is a lot of people like to have the control and all of the information under one roof. Um, if you have a question on billing and you can, you know, pick up the phone and call someone who is set to work from you from eight to five, and you know that they're going to answer the phone, that's obviously going to be a pro of doing it in-house. Yeah. Now, when you think about kind of when it makes more sense, are there rules of thumb, like when you have less than 10 clinicians, you should probably um, like outsource it versus if you have more than 10, then maybe bring it in-house. Are there any rules of thumb like that? Yeah, I think the bigger that your practice gets, right, the the harder it is to manage. And so if you're trying to manage 10 practitioners and the internal operations of your practice, you might not be an expert at billing and that's okay because that you know, that's that's what third-party billing companies are for, right? You want to stick to what you're the expert at, and I think that sometimes especially if you have the larger practice and if you're trying to wear too many hats all at once, that's when you're, you know, you're not, maybe not doing everything as good as it possibly could be, which ultimately is going to slow down your reimbursement. And maybe it's also taking attention away from some of the tasks that should be more of your priorities, such as like client care, programming, um, things like that. Mm -hmm. From new patients faced with an empty lobby and no idea where to find their therapist, to clinicians with a session running overtime and the doorbell ringing, some of the most anxiety-ridden moments of a therapy appointment happen before a session even starts. This episode's sponsor, The Receptionist for iPad, helps you tackle some of that pre-appointment apprehension. The Receptionist for iPad is an easy-to-use digital client check-in system that helps your visitors check in securely to their appointments and notify their practitioners of their arrival via SMS, email, or your preferred channel. No more confusion, endless lobby checking, or having clients sign in on paper logbooks? Start a 14-day free trial of The Receptionist for iPad by going to thereceptionist.com slash practice. Make sure to start your trial with that link, and you'll also get your first month free if you decide to sign up. Again, start your trial over at thereceptionist.com slash practice. Now, say there's someone here that's like, yeah, I want to keep it in-house or I want to learn to do this. Walk us through kind of the first, I don't know, seven steps for a solo practitioner that wants to start billing insurance. And then we can also then talk about when it really makes sense to start to to pass that off to other people. But where do people get started if they're just getting going? They're trying to keep costs low. They're not going to hire someone else to do it. What should they do to, to get organized and to start doing their own billing? So I think the first thing that you need to do is to find a software that works for you and that is simple and easy to use. Uh, Like I said before, I like softwares that um, incorporate the scheduling, the billing, the clinical notes, um, all all in one, all in one software and the patient payment portal. So patients can um, log in online. So would that be a software like uh, therapy notes or something like that? Exactly. There, yeah, okay. there's tons of yeah. them out there. I know you like therapy notes. Yeah. Um, so therapy notes is therapy notes is great. And it's it's really incredible like how much EHRs have evolved over the years. And so I think that um I know sometimes people are like resistant. We still actually have therapists who prefer to do everything paper. And you know, the sometimes change is hard. But what you're going to get from making the change is going to really just open up so much opportunity for you and your practice and for optimizing the the small tasks that end up taking a lot of time. So I would say that is number one. Um, number two is determining like whether or not you're going to take insurance. So obviously my in my business, we um, do do insurance. So the next question would be, do you want in-network versus out-of-network? Pros and cons to that. With in-network, you're going to get more referrals. You're going to have a set rate. Um, Some cons, you're not going to be able to balance bill the patient. 
And the reimbursement rates tend to be a little bit lower, or well, tend to be lower than if you were to do a cash or out of network model. So defining defining what you want out of your practice and what some of your goals are in terms of in versus out of network payer strategy, I think that that is also a really good place to start. Um, and then like the third thing would be just how are you going, how are you going to interpret the benefits? Do you understand what a deductible is, a copay is, and coinsurance? Insurance policies can be super complex. So it's really, really important that you or someone on your staff has that basic understanding and feel super comfortable talking to patients about what their responsibility is. And then also what, you know, how, how you're going to collect that money from them if the insurance doesn't reimburse. Mm-hmm. And then, I mean, do you want me to go into the... Um, I, yeah, keep going. <laughs> keep going? Okay. So those are some of the tips for just getting set up um, to start. But then, you know, there's obviously like credentialing. If you're taking insurance, you need to make sure that you're set up with insurance companies. I cannot tell you how many times we've taken over for someone who wanted to do the billing in-house. They say, you know, we've been submitting all of these claims and nothing's getting paid. Um, and all as it is, is simply like sending in a form that says, Hey, we want to be a provider for your insurance company. And unfortunately, this is what gets a little bit frustrating is each state and, and each insurance company has different regulations. So it's important to look into like what your specific state requires. Um, we just set up a client, for example, in Georgia and in Georgia, you just have, for Anthem, Blue Cross, you submit an insurance claim and they automatically process your information. But in California, you have to submit your, you have to submit um, an application to become a provider. You have to submit your W-9, your license. So there's different requirements for different states and making sure that you know what your requirements are um, before you, before you start submitting insurance claims is super, super important. Um, obviously because you want to get paid, but also because once you start submitting claims, if you're not set up, then trying to have them reprocessed becomes a whole different, a whole different um, nightmare, ball game mess, whatever you want to call it. Um, it's just, it's a lot more difficult to, to auto or to correct on the back end than to take your time and make sure that everything is set up on the front end. So I've heard I've heard a lot of um, like billing places say that they do the billing, but they won't do the credentialing because that can be too hard. And it sounds like you guys help <laughs> both. Um, do you recommend that people have someone help them with the credentialing and getting onto the insurances? Or is it just more like state by state? Like it sounds like some states are super easy and other ones maybe aren't. So if we're talking about just submitting, being able to submit claims to an insurance company, um, I think... Any, anyone can do that, but what you have to remember is you have to follow up. Just because you send a form does not mean that the insurance company is going to do what they're supposed to do with it. And I think that that's what, that's, if you have a good billing company, third-party billing company, that's really what you should be paying for is having a dedicated account representative or representative representatives who have the time to make the tedious insurance calls to make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. Mm, Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So what's after that? Um, Something that I, you know, think is probably the most important part of insurance billing, whether you're doing it, well, just insurance billing period is timely follow-up on denied claims. So, the way that our company works is um, every Monday, our staff posts all the payments that come in electronically, and then they run a report, what I call a denial report, of everything that's denied for the week. So we know exactly what claims have been denied, and we can follow up on them that day. So that's just the process. Monday is posting payments, following up on claim denials. That way, that when if something denies... It's being addressed right away. You're not waiting two weeks for it to to address it because that's just going to end up leading to longer, um, longer claims processing times. 
So the timely follow-up on denied claims is super key. And then the rest of the week should really be about managing outstanding accounts receivable. So anything that's, you know, oh, and, and again, your EHR software, your billing software should have these reports where you're able to understand where your money is. In an ideal world, right, all, all insurance claims or all, all claims in general should be paid in under 30 days. That's the ideal. Of course, there's things that happen. Insurance companies deny things um, for no reason. And so that's where the timely follow-up comes in. Um, but, you know, like I said, when, the, when something denies, if it ends up being old and you have to appeal it, it's going to end up in that 60 to 90 day category. And continuing to do follow-up during those times is also really important because just the same um, appeals, appeals or follow-up goes the same as credentialing. Just because you call on a claim and the insurance representative says they're sending it back for reprocessing, it doesn't mean that that's what they did. So um, I always say, you know, give it 20 days. And if nothing has happened, then call again and get a reference number. Make sure you're documenting all of all of the attempts to process the claim so that if you do end up having to send an appeal down the line, you have like concrete evidence of all of the things that you've done. And that really like will end up leaving you with a kind of bulletproof appeal, which is also very important um, in medical billing and insurance. Yeah. I mean, are there things that like when people come to work with you, are there things that you just wish they would have known before they came to work with you that would, would have made your life as a biller easier or would have made their just lives as a therapist easier? Oh, man. Oh, um, man, I don't know why I'm stuck on this one. I, I just did, I think it for me, it kind of comes back to the verification of benefits and doing ever everything that you need to do on the front end. Um, like I said, just getting the proper name, address, making sure the address on the insurance card matches the address on the driver's license. Um, because all of the, if you can get that process nailed down on the front end, your claim submission should be seamless. It really mm. should be. And, and that's like, just again, the simplest thing that really makes the world of difference. Mm. Well, I'm glad you brought it back to that. And that's probably why you were stumped for a little bit there because <laughs> it's like it, you covered it and it's like these really simple little things that people screw up. Uh, Rachel, if every private practitioner in the world were listening right now, what would you want them to know? I would want them to know, I know a lot of private practitioners, they hesitate to take insurance and I get it. Insurance, insurance is super difficult, but there are ways where you can still be profitable and also take insurance. Um, I have some practitioners who, who do an in versus out of network payer strategy where for their in network, you know, they, they might take, let's say something with like Anthem or Blue Cross and in network, and they just know that they're going to be accepting a lower, a lower rate, but that might give them the volume. Whereas they might then take Cigna or something, um, a different insurance company out of network where they can collect cash up front and then still bill the insurance company and have the money go straight to the patient. So there's not a whole lot of um, back end transaction problems. It's just you build the insurance out of network, collect the cash up front, and then the insurance company will send the money to the patient. I think that there are ways to navigate taking insurance and still um, having a lucrative, profitable practice. And I know that a lot of therapists really stray away from it because, um, because of some of the challenges I just described. Mm. Well, if people want to learn more about uh, what you guys offer, where should we send them? You can go to uh, dataprobillingservice.com. Um, there's a contact us page, or you can reach out to me um, directly. Uh, I manage the Data Pro Billing Service um, Instagram page or um, 
like I said, or the website. Yeah, kind of do it all. So you can find us at DataProBillingService.com. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate it. You know, I think insurance is one of those things that when I started my practice, um, most of the panels were closed in northern Michigan because they had whatever amount of therapists they wanted, which um, now obviously it's like a lot of people need therapy and uh, a lot of insurances are looking to get people go on their panels. So to, to have trainings like this is so helpful to be able to just learn more um, and to be able to just get to a different level. Uh, you know, we couldn't do shows like this without our sponsors. Uh, the sponsor for this episode is The Receptionist. The Receptionist is so amazing in helping you out um, to be able to get to that next level, um, to be able to just have the help that you need. And so head on over to thereceptionist.com um, to help you be able to have a better check-in process for your community, for when people come in. I know when I had my group practice, someone would walk in the door and we didn't know if it was my client or someone else's. The receptionist uh, for the iPad is so perfect to inform your clinicians when their clients show up. Uh, so make sure you check out thereceptionist.com uh, forward slash Joe. And thank you so much for letting me into your ears and into your brain. Have an amazing day. I'll talk to you soon. Special thanks to the band Silence is Sexy for that intro music. And this podcast is designed to provide accurate and authoritative information in regard to the subject matter covered. It is given with the understanding that neither the host, the producers, the publishers, or guests are rendering legal, accounting, clinical, or other professional information. If you want a professional, you should find one. <laughs>